here. This is Awaken Live. Our ministry is Life Poured Out International. Our mission is to reach the lost, ignite the church, and serve the poor. You can see right there at the bottom, this is Awaken Live. So before we go ahead and have our guest on the show, I'm just going to make sure that this is public so you guys can share this at the bottom here. For some reason, it goes private. So I'm clicking on it now, and it is public. So boom, right there, you can share this at the bottom. And um, you can comment as well. I know it's been a little while. Our last guest was Chad Johnson. But then with the release of my book, Immersed in His Glory, I've been on other people's broadcasts. I was on with Larry Sparks. I was on with Eric Walker and Sean Tabbitt from Chosen. So, And I've been also doing the Immersed course. And session two is this Wednesday via Facebook Live. So I've been doing all these different lives. So I've been trying to coordinate when to do an Awaken Live. But from today on, I'm going to be at least doing one a week sometimes two a week because we have so many guests and God is really opening up the doors to have some really beautiful anointed people that are making an impact in this world. So feel free to comment here at the bottom. Thank you, Evangelist David, for watching. We like this to be um, very organic. We like you guys to say hi to us. You could send likes, hearts, that stuff's not distracting. And you could also share this right next to the comment section at the bottom. There's a share button. It'll just go to your platform to people who um, who are on your page. So this message can go out to them because I believe we're sharing a crucial word today. And if, if, if people hear it and they believe it in their hearts, it has the power to set them free. Thank you everyone who is watching this right now. I am stoked to have a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine. He was in my wedding party. I, I've known him for years. But before I have him on, let me just remind you of a couple things. My book, Immersed in His Glory, just came out. January 16 with Destiny Image Publishers. If you go to destinyimage.com, you can get an eight-part e-course and they send you a free copy of the book. So I'll put that in the comment section later when this broadcast is over. But then also, this is really cool, March 3rd at Christ for the Nations Institute, we're having our second immersed conference and Upper Room is going to be there with us worshiping. I'm going to have my friend Will Miller, Stephen Gout. I'm going to have um, Jonathan Lewis as well. He's going to be there worshiping. It's just going to be a time to experience the presence and the glory of God. We just had our immersed conference, our first one in New Jersey, and it went way beyond my expectations. People were crying in the presence of God. There was so much freedom. It was explosive. There was no agenda. It was a very low budget conference. We didn't have all the bells and whistles, but there was just, we just created a space for the Holy Spirit to come and invade and people came hungry. We packed out this church and it was just, he had his way and he transformed lives. There was so much ministry time. So if you're in the Texas area, if you're in the Dallas area, especially or somewhere nearby, or if you don't mind taking a road trip, come on out to Dallas for March 3rd this year. So it's about a month away and sign up for Immerse Conference. I'll put the Eventbrite link in the comment and the status section when I'm done with this interview. Thank you for watching. Desiree, she's watching. Evangelist David, thank you for watching. So anyway, I am so excited to have my guest on here today. Um, his name is Gabriel Zamora. I met him in Bible school. We attended Christ for the Nations together. He's become one of my best friends. He is an in-depth, profound teacher. He won't say this stuff about himself, so I'm just going to say it about him. I, I love him. He um, He's traveled all over preaching the gospel. He's been a youth pastor for a number of years. He's going to share his story a little bit with you. He's going to share kind of what he's doing now, but he's an anointed minister, a profound teacher, a youth pastor. And I'm going to get Gabriel on here. No further ado. How you doing, my brother? You're on here now. I'm great. How about yourself? Dude, I'm really good. Thanks for taking time to be on the Awaken Live with me today. Yeah, I'm super excited and um, honored for the opportunity to be able to speak right now and and share. And uh, man, I think I just even again, like Michael already stated, we've kind of known each other since Bible college days. And to just really see um, Michael's heart for the Lord and then ultimately Selena when he when he met her and their passion for Jesus and and people uh, be fleshed out into all that God is doing is really, really cool. So I'm just excited to be a part of it. And um, who knew in a crusty old. Uh, Bible college uh, apartments uh, that that God was was putting something together that was going to last and last the, the 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 span of time. Absolutely, man. We and we always talked about it. You know, after Bible school, we're going to do stuff together. We're going to stay friends. We're going to partner. You know, for the kingdom. And we've been doing that, man. When you pastored in New York, I came in and ministered, and you lived there. So we're always with each other. And now doing this, and this is just the beginning, bro. This is just the beginning. Amen. I agree. 
<laughs> so for people who don't know who you are, um, just tell them kind of where you're at now. Uh, just just give them a little bit of a, a glimpse into, into who you are. Yeah, so uh, my wife and I just recently made a transition to Southwest Florida. And so we're around white sand beaches and um, it's beautiful. Some of you, I don't know where you find yourself in the world today or the country, it might be extremely cold, but it's like 80 degrees here right now. So, um, but in the summer, don't worry, it feels like someone's breathing on you inside of their mouth, like just you're in their breath, it's so hot. But we were in New York for four years. We were youth pastors there and God saw God do a really extremely cool work and saw a group come from uh, a small number and into hundreds and really had thousands of first time visitors come through the doors. And um, God's just been good. I always had a heart for missions. My wife and I actually thought we were going to be missionaries. I've had the honor to minister in 22 different countries on four different continents. And so God's been really gracious that way. But we found ourselves in the local pastorate in america and um, primarily that's been with students and so now we're at a church here in southwest florida in fort myers first assembly of god fort myers and i am the student ministries pastor of our of our youth ministry here and we call ourselves youth church and um and so we're excited i believe in young people i believe in the bible support of young people theologically i think if we look through the biblical narrative from genesis to revelation um, God is intentional and has always used young people. And you can see that going, um, whether it's from Joseph to Daniel, to Mary, uh, to Jeremiah, um, and then to ultimately the apostles. I think you can make a substantial argument that 11 of the 12 were teenagers. Um, Timothy was a young man and given the most, uh, one of the largest churches in, in the early church, which was Ephesus, the third largest uh, city in the Roman Empire. And so it's like you're given the big mega church in Chicago as a young man. So in any case, I, I am I love that we're in student ministry. I don't believe it's junior ministry. Young people are not the future of the church. They're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. We're all the expression of God's kingdom. Um, and so I love that. And so we call ourselves youth church and believe in to see young people be used significantly of God. And, and we've seen that. So that's kind of where we are presently. Um, and so we're, we're here in Florida and we're uh, we've already seen God move, starting to move. And we've been here since five days before Hurricane Irma. Yeah, so, that was that was wild. First of all, real fast. How did that feel moving everything from New York to Florida and then having that hurricane hit? So I definitely had some candid conversations with God. <laughs> I, uh, I was like, it feels disorienting if any of you have ever moved across the country and we've done it twice. Um, you just kind of get your, your, your feet settled, if you will. And, and then this hurricane came through and I'm not from a place where inclement weather is something that's normal. And yeah. so when I saw a hurricane coming through and I'm watching the news, um, I know God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but I definitely was battling with one. And so was extremely just, um, didn't mm. know how to really do, I mean, we were still in our, in boxes. We weren't even unpacked and, uh, <laughs> I had to drive two hours north to Tampa, Florida and fly my family out. And they spent the hurricane in Dallas and I stayed back with some friends and so that we could be first responders. And it was, it was not the way I would have seen ministry starting in an area, but I just believe in the core of my conviction that as a pastor or a minister, wherever we find ourselves, if you're a volunteer in a church or a missionary or a mother or father or whatever have you, we're building people not program. And I think God made that very evident to me when we first got here because mm -hmm. there was no putting together a service. Uh, there wasn't power. Um, there was no putting together a discipleship track and, and getting your leaders together and having a big meeting. It was getting out, putting up shutters on homes and bringing water and ice to people who didn't have power. It was building people and letting the, the kingdom of God, the people of God, be tangibly expressed through our love. And so it, in one sense, it was extremely disorienting for my family, but I believe it was, it was a huge um, opportunity for the kingdom of God to be shown fruitful. And uh, the reality is, is during those hurricanes, whether it was Harvey or Irma, 80% of all aid came from the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, for all our messes and the church is, is imperf imperfect, right? I know that, but in all of her imperfections, we still show up. Um, because it's innate inside of us. It's who we are. Yeah, so. that's really good. That's really good. And you were talking about young people and even a youth pastor for a while. And if I remember correctly, I think when we first 
<laughs> became your friends. I got a prophetic word for you. And it was very candid. Like you said, it was, if you guys don't work with youth, you're in sin. Just straight yeah. up. People might think, yo, that's a very harsh word. I said it with all the love in my heart, but I really just felt like these people are called to youth. And if they just want to go on the mission field somewhere and preach the gospel and not deal with youth, they're outside of God's will. But I've seen, I've seen that fleshed out in your life, man, in a beautiful way. Oh, it's so true. I remember being, um, uh, wanting to, you know, <laughs> you, I, I was livid. I was like, who's this guy think he is? Cause I wanted to be a missionary and, and, um, I just felt like Dominique and I were, my wife is named Dominique. Dominique and I were going to give our lives on the mission field. And we were so excited about that. Like when I was in Bible college, I never hung out with the youth ministry guys. I never took ministry class. I was like, it just wasn't really my flow. And then I ended up, uh, did taking the youth ministry class and God bless me. But Michael came in the middle of our Bible school days and was like, if you're not pouring into youth, you're in sin. <laughs> and I'm like, are you in uh, sin speaking on behalf of God? If that's untrue, you know, I thought, <laughs> man, uh, well, Michael evidently heard from God. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't speak that candidly unless I knew I heard from the Lord. But, dude, I've been I've, I've seen you in the ups and downs and I've seen you, your fruit and everything. And I just love who you are. I love what you and your wife carry, man. And it's an honor to know you guys. But, um, dude, something I really love about you is your story and kind of how you grew up and what God's brought you through to get you where you are today. I think that's really going to inspire a lot of people. And it's also going to help us, you know, as, as a springboard, kind of get into our topic of identity here today. So, man, tell us a bit about your testimony so people know who you are and, and share whatever you'd like about that. Yeah. So uh, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, for those of you who don't know, that is in the United States. And um, my, uh, my dad was in and out of prison my whole life. And so when I was a young, a young baby, I was 11 months old, he was already serving or was it uh, rather on trial for the first of three convicted felonies he would have by the time I was eight years old. And so I actually took my first steps inside of a county jail. We were visiting my dad for the um, in, in the county jail during that time. My mom had, had, had found uh, the Lord at that time. She had kind of been raised in the Catholic tradition, very, um, very traditional Hispanic Catholic background. She went through all of the, um, the liturgy and the first Holy Communion and everything that goes along with the Catholic Church. But when I was really young, she got introduced to this um, women's Bible study meeting. And man, they were they were Pentecostal. I mean, they were they were encountering God's presence. And my mom uh, really got involved there. And so that kind of went on again. My dad's in and out of prison. So by the time I'm five years old, we were actually in one of those Bible study meetings. And uh, like every good Pentecostal Bible study meeting does, it took a little long. And so I'm in the back room coloring things with the other kids and I come out and I'm just kind of curious on what's going on. I start asking questions about Jesus and what's going on. And so the ladies there explain Jesus to me. I actually um, at five years old, I accept Jesus into my life and I felt the power of God. And, and in fact, um, they begin to prophesy over me. And, um, many of those words have been echoed and repeated by others who have no correlation to those people. And so I don't know where you find yourself today, but I, I believe in the spirit of prophecy and, and, and the gift of prophecy. And so in any case, at five years old, I got this insatiable desire for Jesus. And so I would come home and I'd ask my mom and said, you know, I don't want to watch cartoons. Can I just watch the TV preachers? And, and she'd be like, okay. So I'd put on the TV preachers and, um, and I'd watch them. And then I would actually stay up until like the middle of the morning around 2 a.m. It was real late at night. Uh, Bonky, Reinhard Bonky would come on. He was doing these big crusades in Africa and, and in his German accent, all of Africa shall be saved. And I just had this, this burning desire to preach the gospel all over the world like Bonky. And instead I would go into my room and I would line up all my stuffed animals and I would begin to preach to them. And, and then I would hit them with my hand and they'd get slain in the Holy Ghost. And, um, when I would try to baptize them, my grandma stopped me. And so I was just, I mean, I was dreaming. I really, God was real. And uh, life just kind of took us. It was already, my dad was in that prison again. My mom felt like she had had enough. And she um, she divorced my father when I was six years old. And so what ended up happening at that point is my mother, my brother, and myself were then forced to go into homeless shelters, live out of our car. And um, you know, there was times during the winter I spent holidays in the homeless shelters and and living on um you know government assistance and 
living out of the car. One time it was cold and she put pick open the trunk and pulled out a gallon of milk and some pop tarts, mm-hmm. closed the trunk. That was also our table and mm-hmm. breakfast was served. And yeah. uh, my mom ultimately ended up qualifying for a program. Um, I don't know where you're watching. You may be from a different part of the world called Section 8, which is Project Housing in America, mm-hmm. government-funded housing. So we went into the projects. And um, at eight years old, my dad, again, was in and out of prison. At eight years old, I found myself inside of a federal courtroom, and my dad was being sentenced to 22 years in a federal penitentiary um, straight. And uh, a sentence he he served all of my life. And my mom was struggling to make financial um, ends me and so she started doing um, probably things that was probably uncharacteristic of her uh, for sure was uncharacteristic for her. so she started to lose her faith a little and was discouraged she started moving drugs and in and out of the prison system for organized crime in the state of new mexico and mm. so at that time my mom ends up um actually dating a high-ranking member of this of this uh you know organized crime and he ends up becoming my stepfather and so what ends up happening, I guess, start getting raised around this gang that's extremely violent and um, a lot of those different things. And at 10 years old, they stick a knife in my hand. They're teaching me how to stab somebody. Yeah. And so at that point, violence wasn't just um, tolerated in my home. It was promoted. And I know you guys, you guys can't see me, but I'm, I'm short. I'm baby faced. I can't go facial hair. And so I, I try to act out extremely violent and prove myself that I was my father's son or my stepdad's son that, that I would, I would have respect because of those things. And so through my middle school years, I was, I was rolling around with the gang members and it's, it's all I knew. There was gangs, there was drugs around me, violence everywhere. And at um, 13, 14 years old, my mom would, we would go to church on Sunday mornings, but we were struggling with stuff at home, extreme poverty. And this, this, um, Joe's pastor and youth pastor just kept reaching out to my younger brother. And I like wanted us to come, kept inviting us, kept inviting us. And we finally came and, I ended up encountering the presence of God again, and he just it completely transformed my heart. And I had this insatiable desire for Jesus again. And I remember I had never, um, I, I, I had, I had, I had never felt this before. And all of those dreams of preaching and, and, and seeing the gospel go forward in the nations all came flooding back to me. And that summer, a couple in my church paid for me to go to uh, Youth for the Nations, which is Christ for the Nations um, summer camp in Dallas, Texas. Huge thousands of students. I'll be speaking there this summer as well. But I ended up going there and God just wrecked my world. And I became so on fire for Jesus that I just got an insatiable desire um, for the scriptures that was um, absolutely um, probably uh, crazy for my age. And so what ended up happening is, I started memorizing scripture um, like crazy. I would write it on three by five cards and I was just memorizing chapter, verse, word for word, really got the word inside of me. Now, at this point, my mom had sold drugs. She had never done drugs. And again, she had, she had gone through a lot in life, my, my mother, and she picked up a drug addiction in my high school years. And so they were the home environment was 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 really, really fragmented and terrible at this time. And so at home, I was essentially in a drug house. I was finding myself in the closet in the back room by myself, just falling in love with the scriptures and had a crazy um, local church that just believed in young people and developed me and gave me a place of community and family. And we were doing mission trips. We were preaching, teaching, doing retreats, leading small groups. Um, it was, it was, it was incredible. And so it, I could literally say I fell in love with Jesus, essentially in a drug house in the back room with the scriptures with just me and Jesus. Now I've been to Bible college later in seminary and, I may not have exegeted the passage properly, may not have used proper hermeneutics, but I was in love with the living God and he was revealing himself to me. So I get out of those high school years and I'm on fire for Jesus. I meet my wife and I'm, about, I'm 18 years old and I'm, I, find, I meet my wife and she's actually from a really rough background too. We are the perfect recipe for dysfunction, but God. And um, my wife grew up without her mother. Her mother was in and out of her life. Um, and struggled with her own drug addiction and was in and out of prison as well. And, um, you know, her dad um, struggled a little bit, too, and was was uh, doing his best to try to raise, for, uh, you know, four kids by himself. And so that, that created a crazy environment. But we just we became I fell in love with Jesus together, started believing for our family. And um, so just to pull some of that full circle is uh, my mother in law has been clean off of drugs for four years. Um, my mom's been off of, of drugs for eight years 
Um, my younger brother is not a gang member. In fact, he's in law enforcement, which is an anomaly from our background. I've never done drugs. I'm not in gangs. I'm not in prison. I'm not any of those things. Um, I'm, a, I'm a happily married man of eight years. I have two kids. Uh, I may not be the perfect father and husband, but definitely much further along than I could have ever dreamed or imagined. And then May 24th of this of 2017, May 24th of 2017, my dad was released from prison. And I hugged him for the first time since I was eight years old in person at the New York Port Authority in New York City. And he actually lives with me right now. And that is absolutely crazy. I'm not mad. I'm not angry. I'm not uh, messed up about any of those uh, those things. But he's uh, he's doing well. He's serving God. And um, just a real story of reconciliation. And um, coming from that background, I just I, there was some things that I had struggled with and and felt like I couldn't get past. And one of the main things was this. And that's why I think it's so important for us to talk about identity today. And that's this. I was actually already in Bible college, had already been doing ministry. And I couldn't shake these spurts of um, rage or anger or feeling um, uh, injustice uh, done towards me or, or you know, just feeling um, misunderstood or offended. I just had anger issues. And um, and I felt like, you know, it would be something I'd struggle with my whole life. You know, like some people, you know, whether your issues, lust or insecurity or anxiety. Um, there was just something I was probably going to struggle with my whole life. And Michael, you, you actually came back from Mozambique and yeah, had just yeah. done his training school um, with Heidi uh, Baker. And so he came back and he had kind of run into this new revelation, not a new revelation. And we stumbled upon something that's always been evident in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. From, from oh, all yeah. And he just started talking about identity and, and our, and how we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And for the first time, I actually, I remember looking up into the ceiling in my apartment in Bible college and I just started crying and I said these words out loud. I am not angry. And for the first time, I didn't self-identify with my sin, but with my sonship. That's it. That's it. And can I tell you this today? God is my witness. I haven't been in a fight. I haven't punched something. I haven't lost my my mind like that again really, really a new, new, new creation. In Daniel chapter three, I was reading this yesterday. At the end of the chapter, this is the the three Hebrew boys coming out of the furnace of King Nebuchadnezzar because they wouldn't bow to um, the statue. And it comes out, they said they didn't even smell like smoke. If you know anything about smoke, you can't get the smell of smoke off your clothes. If you stand in front of a fire, it's impossible. But it's crazy to me how you can be in hell's kitchen. You can be in an environment so engrossed with sin or the effects of, of, of fallen humanity and not even smell like smoke because God's redemption is that good. It's not halfway. It's all the way. And Bro, uh, this is, I love, I love your story, man. I love that you were young and you were in a house where drugs were happening all around you. There was darkness all around you, but the Lord was ministering to you. You were being fed. He was speaking to you. There's no atmosphere too dark that the Lord won't penetrate, that the Lord won't dwell in. If there's a hungry heart there looking for him, seeking after him. And dude, even your story of, you know, I, this is, this is, your, dude, your story is so powerful because God's reconciled so many things in your life, but that all of the odds were literally stacked against you and your wife. All of the odds, every statistic, you should be a statistic right now. You should be defeated. You should be in jail. You should be hooked on drugs. If people were to look at your life and look at your story, then that's what it should be. But I just love the fact that you, your brother, Dominique, your mother, your father, you know, that, that there's been such a, a redemptive work that has taken place where you guys are literally, you've, you've risen above it, you're more than a conqueror, and now you're helping other people that are stuck, trapped, that are statistics, you're helping them rise up through this revelation of the finished work of Christ, through this revelation of identity. And I just, man, I just love that about you. And I remember that time in your room. I remember because I got set fire with the revelation that I am dead to sin and I'm alive to Jesus Christ. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. Everything that has to do with the old is gone. And the new has fully come that my nature of sin was crucified to death on that cross. So now I can live in the resurrection life of Jesus. I can now be a part, uh, I'm a partaker of the divine nature. When I began to understand that, I began to walk in the freedom that was already mine in the first place. And I just love it because you caught the revelation. You caught it. Okay, 
since the Bible says I'm dead to sin, that means I'm dead to sin. Since anger is sin, that means I'm dead to anger. And you literally, you, you stopped identifying with Adam. You stopped identifying with the corruption that came in through Adam. And you started to identify with the blessings, with the power that was released through Jesus Christ. Amen. And you spoke it out in faith. I am no longer angry. I'm not angry anymore. Dude, and I remember literally the whole atmosphere of that room shifted. You felt the presence. You began to weep. It was just like God's here and this is a holy moment. And this is something funny, a part of that story, because days later, you know, we we're always hanging out every day and I'd yeah. go to your house and you're like, bro, I literally stubbed my foot. And instead of cussing, tongues came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like, I haven't been angry. You're like, I can't I can't even remember sinning in the past few days. And that sounds blasphemous and crazy. But you're yeah. like, I, I literally I've just been walking in peace. And I'm like, man, that's the power of the gospel. We could live above sin. That's Amen. good news. Come on. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so i absolutely love that aspect of your story man how you got free from anger um you know and uh dude i know there has to be you know this is something that we'll touch on as well growing up you know without a father or at least you know your father was in jail so so you didn't have access to him you weren't able to speak to him all the time you know and thank god he's in your life now the lord's redeemed that but just growing up you know under you know you know in that gang circle and then with you know not having your father with you all the time there must have been some other identity issues that that you had to walk through or maybe you know and we see these same issues with with everybody that we that we bump into or with your youth since you're a youth pastor you see these issues what are some serious identity like identity issues that that you see in your life yeah i think some other ones that i that kind of begin to be identified and, and really seeing god bring complete freedom with i remember being a young man and my senior pastor that i grew up under um it was an incredible man. His name's Steve Uliberry. Um, but I never actually had a personal relationship with him as a young man growing up, even though my senior pastor, pastor actually sought one out with me because he believed in me and wanted to kind of mentor me. But I was so insecure that I felt like I couldn't be around people that I felt were successful. So I felt he was successful being a senior pastor of a church. Maybe someone was successful in business. Um or in the marketplace, maybe they're an educator or whatever. I couldn't like, I, I'm a talker and I could, couldn't find myself articulating. The insecurity was so profound because I hadn't had that father's affirmational blessing that you see Jesus even receive in Matthew 3, Luke, Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, that, that this is my son and who I'm all pleased. It's so important for us to hear that from a father. And Jesus ultimately does that, you know. Uh, for us, but I, I hadn't received. So it was really hard for me to walk through that place. And then to know that I had a God that was with me in my present times, because here's the thing about my dad, even though he was in prison, my dad thinks I'm the best thing since sliced bread, but he was in prison. So I felt like God liked me, but he wasn't a part of my everyday life. So I felt like an orphan and I had to scratch and claw for everything. So I never understood an inheritance of grace, but only that which I earned. Yeah. And um, so whether that was um, in terms of sanctification to financial provision, to um, promotion in ministry or in my job, I felt like all of it had to be earned. Nothing could ever be an inheritance of grace. Yeah, and I've seen even your life, man. You've got amazing testimonies. We could probably be on here for a long, long time if you were to share all the financial provision testimonies, all of the um, just increase and favor that's been on your life for ministry, different open doors. But I remember in Bible school, man, you had a you had a moment like when you first showed up to school and you had to pay for you and your wife and you were trying to go to school and you were like, you just had a moment where you were, you were just broke down. You're just like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I remember I had a cross that my sister gave me and I was just, I was just wearing it. Actually, my, I'm sorry. My parents gave it to me. I had this cross around my neck and the Lord told me to give it to you and to say, listen, the cross did not just pay for your sins. The cross, you know, paid for everything, every blessing, every resource, everything that you need was provided through the cross because he died. There's more than enough. And I gave it to you and dude, share, share some stories that took place after that. And I'm not, I'm not taking any credit for that, bro. I was just an instrument for the Lord. He just wanted me to encourage you. But yeah. at the same time, man, I just love how I've just I've seen so much favor on your life with people, you know, giving you positions or giving you a platform. But then apart from that, man, you have some awesome financial stories that kind of what took place after that. 
Yeah, it was uh, incredible. We were sitting in our Bible college. Um, this is this is a couple of days after you had given me that cross. And I was sitting in my apartment at Christ for the Nations. And I've never been lazy. I'm not a, like a, you know, I've always go, want, was willing to work and work construction uh, to provide for my family with school at night uh, before Bible college. And so when I got there, I knew that God had called Dominique and I to be at Christ for the Nations. But we're struggling to make that bill. And um I mean, we didn't even we didn't even go on a date that semester. We didn't even have a McDonald's cheeseburger. That's how broke we were. We we didn't have milk nor ramen noodles in the refrigerator. We had half a loaf of bread and some water. And mm-hmm. everything we had, we were putting towards that bill. I was valeting cars, and she was serving tables. And I actually broke down in my living room. I started crying, and I said these words out loud. You can't make this up. This is real life. Said these words out loud. God, if I heard your voice to come here. Would you affirm me as a son and validate me as a man and help me provide for my wife as I'm here? As I'm saying this, the phone rings as I'm saying this out loud. And um, this incredible family gets on the other line. And unbeknownst to me, they feel called to help my wife and I get through Bible college. Hmm. When I say help us get through, pay for our Bible school. In both its, of you, both of us, in yep. its entirety, for the next five semesters, I graduated Bible college with no debt. Hmm. I mean, I cried for two days straight. Like I literally said out loud, "God, validate me as a man, affirm me as a son." That I heard your voice to come here. In the very moment, the phone rings, and it's this beautiful family that's like. And it was that that moment that the the cross, the gospel appropriated more than mercy and forgiveness, that it, all good things, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. So there's no variance of change or shifting shadows, James 1.17. And it was that moment, an inheritance of grace that I had never experienced in my life. And, um, you know, the dollar amount of all of that was around $40,000, unbelievable, you know, and then we didn't have a computer. Someone knocks on our door. We feel called to give you this iMac. An iMac, Mm. I mean, we're not even talking about a PC here, people. I don't know where you stand on that, but (laughs) use Apple, I'm just kidding. Uh, And just financial provision after financial provision, we've had, um, you know, cars given to us and now I've had the privilege to give cars away. I mean, it's just, God is just, crazy and it was in it it was funny I, I that cross I would I would hold it all the time especially when I was feeling insecure and I was like God you've provided for more than my mercy more than for forgiveness and um it was just yeah. a complete act of grace um all that that was that that happened because of the provision of of the cross it was absolutely incredible god is much better than we give him credit for many times that's right that's right and thank you everybody who's watching right now pastor daniel sanabria said my man gabe he's watching nice. johnny from sweden what's up adam thank you for watching melissa feel free to share this at the bottom so people could be encouraged by this but um this is one thing i i really love man i went on a bible um just study rampage one time and i'm like where the bible talks about the power of god so so what does the bible say about the power of god and i began to read through the epistles of paul and as i would read through the epistles of paul i found three places where it talked about the power of god and let me just hold on before i even share this let me know at the bottom if you guys could hear us clearly see us clearly because i see a little bit of a blurriness on my end but maybe it's clear on your end. So if you guys are watching, let me know if you could see us. All right. But I saw, man, it says in Romans 1 16, the gospel is the power of God on the salvation for those who believe. And then you have first Corinthians 1 18, where it says the gospel is foolishness for those who are perishing, but it is the power of God for those who believe it. So then you have just a few verses later, first Corinthians 1 24, it says Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. So now you have Three verses that talk about the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. Christ is the power of God. And the cross is the power of God. Jesus hung on the cross and that's the gospel. He took everything that Adam brought in. Every barrier of sin, every bit of death. He absorbed it in his body and it was crucified to death. And it stayed in the grave with Jesus. And when he rose from the dead, he brought us a brand new life of blessing. A life of freedom. A life of joy. Whatever the devil stole. 
Jesus came to restore in our lives. So I love it, man. When, you, when we get a, re, a revelation of that cross, he, he, every resource, every bit of provision, every bit of freedom, joy, power, anointing, health, whatever I need in my life is provided through that cross. And since the cross and the gospel is the power of God, you begin to see a manifestation of that favor, a manifestation of that blessing, man. And you, and that's your story. It's, it's all over you, man. I just absolutely love that. And now you're a youth pastor and, and you're pouring into the lives of young people from all different backgrounds. Now, how do you disciple a generation, a young generation, and not only a young generation, but the church in general, you know, like we're all, we're all children of God. We all need to understand identity, but specifically in your context right now, you're dealing with youth on a regular basis. I know you do leadership courses and you, and you minister to leaders. But how do you disciple people in this revelation of identity? Because people say, well, what do I just teach about identity? And I and I don't tell people what to do. You know, I don't you know, we don't correct people or we don't you know, you know. So how does that identity revelation? How do you disciple people in that so they see freedom in their lives? Yeah, I think uh, for we, we need to bring back a masculine um, understanding of identity too. sometimes I think girls. And women's conferences have this flowery idea of, of accept, find your identity in Christ, especially in the youth circles, and then you'll live pure or whatever. And, and there's real truth to that. And then it's also um, kind of given on an elementary level. But I want to kind of peel back a few layers before I go forward into some practical implications on how you actually flesh out um, the discipleship journey through a finished work uh, perspective and, and a, an identity issue. And that is Many times we have a systematic view of salvation, and that's okay because of systematic theology and the great work um, that some theologians have done towards that end to actually have people um, understand in the framework of salvation or the theologians would call it soteriology. And so we, we kind of and, and pretty much will boil down to this um, met God created man in his image. Man made a mistake and was therefore uh, there was distance created between God and man. So God had to create a substitutionary process to then have relationship with God again. You see that through um, the sacrifice of the Old Testament. Those are also in the uh, ultimately into the fulfillment of Jesus. And so then Jesus comes and dies for our sins so that we can be in relationship with him again. Nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely the truth but it's a systematic view of, of the gospel and not um, what I would feel like is more of a biblical theological framework from Genesis to revelation of redemption and God's redeeming of a people and how that actually spans through the whole of the Bible. So Genesis one twenty seven, we were God created us and God created man in his own image. So let us create man in our own image. He created us in the likeness of God. Genesis chapter two says and in Genesis chapter one that fruit or animals could only produce after their own kind. OK, and then you go into the Gospels and Jesus says this word. He says, unless a seed is sown into the ground and it dies, it cannot produce much fruit. And then it later says in the scriptures in Colossians 1 18 that Jesus is the firstborn amongst the brethren. And so it's this it's this view of if if a seed is sown and goes to the ground and dies and then comes up. Again, it cannot produce much fruit. Here's the reality. Jesus was the seed of heaven sown into the earth, died on a cross, was buried, and then ultimately rose again so that you and I could be the second fruits of his resurrection life. And now we're identifiers with this, with this resurrection life. And you can see that in. So Jesus didn't just die for you. He died as you. And so this is what, how I would explain that. You and I weren't vitally in the garden. We weren't vitally breathing, but we were legally there with humanity when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit. We weren't vitally at the cross. We weren't living and breathing, but we were legally there included in humanity that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Second Corinthians 5, 19. So because of that, you and I would never agree. I mean, we just got to turn on CNN for like five seconds and we would both agree that we are obviously affected by the act of Adam. We would agree with that. But then we come to the gospel and we act like the work of Christ was insufficient. So let me make that practical. This is how it was. I remember getting saved. I was given mercy and forgiveness. God forgives me of my sins. 
But then I had to go and repent of all the sins of my father. But Jesus undid all the sins of my father when he went all the way back to my grandpappy Adam and undid the Adamic nature himself, which was Adam, and gave me a new nature. I've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness according to the divine nature that lives on the inside of me, Second Peter 1, 3. Okay, so I've been given all these things in God. So now when we have a more robust view of the gospel, that it's not just mercy and forgiveness. Many times we have this view of, of the gospel in that you and I are a pile of dung, and we've been covered and christened in gold. The problem with a covered coil, a covered christened pile of dung is it's still a pile of dung. Mm -hmm. And so it's never been actually transformed into a new creation. Second Corinthians 5, 17. It's actually never taken on a new thing. So here's the reality. The gospel is a reality that takes place in the present. The gospel is not hell insurance for us to get to heaven and not be not go to the not fire insurance not go to hell it's yeah. not mercy and forgiveness and then we're left in this galactic battle of fighting against sin that would make us partners in our own salvation and this isn't workspace this is not of works lest any man should both second corinthians i mean second ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 and so there's th th this has nothing to do with us and so this is actually God saves us and sanctifies us all in a work of grace. And so I think to really show this, I mean, Ezekiel says that he's going to come and give us a heart of flesh and put his desires on the inside of us. This yeah. is prophesying of our new nature in Jesus Christ. I love that, verse. that we would have we would have a new nature and then we don't actually believe that happens. And so many times we approach the gospel and if we're discipling people. And we and we they get they get a grasp of the gospel and this okay God forgives me, He's been merciful, but He's not a savior because I still struggle with sin. Mm -hmm. He's not actually that good, and He's still struggling. And, and the reality is, this has never been an issue that's new. In fact, the devil never changed his tactics. So if we go back to Genesis three, when Eve eats of the tree, the serpent says this: "If you eat of this tree, you will be like God." Questions her identity. She was already like God, Genesis 1, 27. Exactly. You go to Matthew 4, Mark 1, Luke 4, the temptation of Jesus. Now, if you go a chapter previous to all of those, he's gotten the affirmation of a son. This is my son, whom I'm well pleased. Then the spirit leads him into the wilderness. First question the devil asks is, if you truly are the son, you just got told he was the son, question right. and on identity. Mm -hmm. Back to 1 Samuel chapter 10, when Saul is anointed as king. This is crazy. He's given a new heart. Go read 1 Samuel chapter 10. He's given a new heart. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. He prophesies. He's guaranteed that anything he touches is going to be blessed. Guaranteed. And then a few verses later, when he's actually being inaugurated as king, they can't find him. He's amongst the stuff. Because he actually didn't believe who he was. A new heart. Holy Spirit came upon him. Prophesied. Everything he's going to touch is guaranteed to succeed. And he still doesn't believe it. And ultimately, we know the end of that story. David ends up succeeding him because he's not able to carry out his obedience because he didn't believe who he is. And so the gospel comes out into this place. I believe every sin is a fundamental disbelief in the gospel. Mm. So many times what we do, if a young man is struggling with pornography, the issue is not. Um, now, we may put more software on his phone, an accountability partner may be needed, but a lot of times what an accountability partner has become is cheap confessional for cheap grace to ease our, our conscience. Hmm. And all we've done is gone to a 1500 model, 1500 century model, and we're going to the Catholic priest and confessing something's already done, and there's real no power in change there because it's actually not keeping us um, – accountable to the gospel. And so what that young man actually needs to hear, the same message we preach at a gospel crusade and someone initially receiving salvation in that God loves you. He's for you. He's pursuing you. He died for you to set you free from the power of sin is the same message the young man is struggling with pornography needs to hear because the fundamental disbelief in the gospel is this, that he can't be fulfilled and that he's not accepted in Jesus. So he's trying to find acceptance through a false version of affirmation and or fulfillment that God actually couldn't keep him. And it's really coming back to the gospel from that place. He's actually given the power to live free from sin because the, the gospel 
is not, it can't just be the cover of sin. It has to be the uprooting of sin or else God is not a savior. Exactly. We've been preaching a partial gospel, not a full gospel. We've been preaching forgiveness of sin, but not the complete erratic, uh, you know, uh, yeah, freedom from sin. Right. So people think I'm forgiven, but I'm still dirty. I'm right. forgiven, but I'm still bound to sin and I'm going to struggle my whole life with sin until one day I die. And then I'm going to be perfect and I'm going to be in heaven. But that means that honestly, if you think about it, that means death is savior, not Jesus Christ. That means exactly. he, didn't do, he didn't do a good enough job. You have to wait until you die before you get enter into perfection or, you know, full righteousness. But but Jesus, he didn't just die to forgive us of our sin. He died to eradicate the entity of sin. And I love this, man, because it's just going to talk a little bit about what you said. People say that God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden because of disobedience. OK, sure. Great. But what was the root of that disobedience? Every act of disobedience, or just like you said, every act of sin comes from one place, unbelief. That's right. Satan made Adam and Eve believe that they weren't like God. So they needed to do something to become like God. Mm -hmm. So first there was unbelief or they believed in what Satan said and not and no longer believed in what God said. And then it was fleshed out through an act of disobedience. So ultimately they were kicked out of the garden because of unbelief. They no longer believe the words of God. They believe the words of the enemy or the lies of the enemy. And I think like what you're getting at is Jesus completed it all. It's a full gospel, um, you know, freedom, um, forgiveness, um, all the resources, all the deliverance, all the healing that we needed was provided in what Jesus Christ did. It was a complete undoing of Adam. But at the same time, we need to believe it. That's we right. Need to believe it. We need to plug into the power source through our faith. And one scripture I love, and I'm going to let you keep touching on this for a minute. Romans 8, 6 says, mind on flesh is death, but mind on the spirit is life and peace. So that's that's the renewal of the mind. We're 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 done with thinking about death and thinking about you know all you know all these lies that the enemy has fed us and all the philosophies we've we've learned of the world. And now we're going to start setting our mind on the spirit. We're going to start setting our mind on truth. And when we do that, we're going to begin manifesting and walking in our true identity. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So I I let me let me circle back. This I believe in accountability partners. I believe accountability partners need to keep each other accountable to the gospel. Yeah. Mm. So if, if I'm accountable with you and you're having a sin issue, then I need to remind you that sin isn't the issue. Your belief that it's the issue is the issue. <laughs> From the power of sin, Romans 6, 7, you know, Colossians 3, 3, for Michael has died and his life is hidden in Christ. Galatians 2, 20, for I have died. I've been co-crucified with Christ. No longer I who lives but Christ who lives in me. If I truly believe Christ lives in me, then I can then go to Galatians 5 and see the fruits of the Spirit and believe just that. They're the fruits of the Spirit, not me. If so, I could ever produce self-control, we would have figured out a way as humanity to do it, but we can't. Those are the actual fruits of the Spirit, not of any of our own. Um, not of Gabriel Zamora or Michael Lombardo or any kind of self-effort that we could put in. Exactly right. And so what I feel, I really believe that discipleship usually comes, it derails off the road in two different scenarios, in two different ways. And this is, I want us to be gospel centered. And again, this is life transformation. This isn't um, a, a word I've, I've picked up on in my, in my studies, moral theistic deism, big word that just means that moral um, behavior or behavior modification has kind of become uh, our God to us or the, our relate, the way we relate to God. And so, um, and, and that's, that's not ever the way Jesus ever intended it to be. Now there are standards, but the thing is, is when Jesus' spirit is living through me, the standards only get higher and they're not burdensome. Yeah. I mm -hmm. want to love my wife. Yeah. I want to love people, but if I'm trying to do that on my own, I just, I, I, I can't every day of the week. So, in, and I'm going to get real practical here. So I don't know if you have children, your brother, a sister, your a youth pastor, a missionary, wherever you find yourself today. And you're, you're, you're in a discipleship relationship with someone. Two ways we kind of usually derail off the road. And, and that is, number one, our discipleship process becomes super pious. It's, it's a lot of piety. And so what that means is uh, I need to read my Bible more. I need to go to church more. I need to fast more. I need to uh, uh, pray more. 
I need to watch less bad movies. I need to um, uh, don't drink caffeine or whatever the, the case may be. Or you go super missional. And, and again, nothing wrong with either of the or, but this word derails and doesn't stay gospel centered. And so then we go to the to the right and we say this. We say, well, I need to be a part of city renewal. Am I at the soup kitchen? Am I giving to the poor? Am I doing missions? Am I, um, um, you know, in the sex trade trafficking industry, stopping the the, the terrible atrocities that are being com- uh, committed against uh, uh, young children? Um, again, nothing bad with those. And then what ends up happening sometimes, too, is the two camps throw rocks at each other. The missional camp is saying, get out of your prayer meeting and do something. And the prayer meeting is saying, you are not holy. You need to seek God, you know. Yeah. So they're both going this way. And then we start to relate to our God, to Jesus, in light of if we're praying more, reading more, fasting more, or if we're at the soup kitchen, a part of a sex trade trafficking, uh, abolishing of of it, whatever. Instead of being gospel centered and from this place, God, I'm accepted in you. I'm loved in you. I am forgiven in you. I'm set free in you. I have all things in you. And then from that place, I want to read my Bible more. Mm-hmm. I want to go to church more and be around the people of God more. I want to give my life to the end of sex trade trafficking. And not if I'm doing those things, I am then accepted. And it's because then we start we start thinking this is actually how we bring tra- – transformation comes from the gospel first. Those are the doings that are the outgrowth of the gospel. And so in terms of behavior, well, how do I set standards? How do I walk someone through something? And so one of the most common things is I'm in youth ministry, so I'm around young ladies all the time. And um, a young lady comes up and, well, PG, they call me PG short for Pastor Gable. Uh, what, what, how short are too short of our shorts? How short should our shorts be? And, um, and uh, I don't, I'm not giving a letter of the law. I just say, well, you're a daughter of the king. You're fully accepted. You're loved. You're cherished. You're sought after by God. You're set free from the power of sin. You don't need acceptance from any young man. Um, and you don't need his eyes looking at you lustfully. So I don't know. How, how short do you think your shorts need to be? Now, they're making a decision through the Holy Spirit governing first as they know who they are. And then from that place, making a moral decision based first out of a finished place in who they are in Christ. And you know what's the crazy part? They usually make a decision nine times out of ten that most conservative people would be accept would be would find acceptable. Because here's the reality. Modesty is contextual. Purity is a non negotiable. Hmm. So if you're from a Caribbean island, less clothing may be more acceptable there, maybe not as acceptable in a different part of the world. And so our thing is not to be caught up on these moral behavioral standards that might just be cultural and not necessarily kingdom and to be kingdom minded and allow from this place that our behavior is informed first by who we are and by looking at Jesus constantly. Second Corinthians 318 says this. Now we behold him. That's Jesus with an unveiled face. New King James says like this as though in a mirror on a mirror. I'm being reflected back. But I'm beholding Jesus in a mirror, being transformed in the very same image from glory to glory. There's one way transformation happens. That's continuously looking at Jesus, continuously seeing his finished work. And the reality is amputees have this common experience. If my arm was cut off and I had a problem, I would feel like it's still itching. But as I looked down at it and saw that it wasn't there, my mind would be renewed. That's what we see in Romans 12 too. Then I approve what is the holy and acceptable sacrifice of the Lord yeah. not transformed. To the world, as I look down and I remind myself that it's not there, then I'm actually renewed to the fact that I don't have an arm anymore. And so, as we continue to look down, we look, we we find back. We look down, we look down, and we find out, oh, I'm not bound to sin anymore. Mm. Dress too big. Can I go after these heels? Romans seven. Just do it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here's a big deal because I know if some of you read your Bible and say, well, what about Romans 7 and Paul saying, I do and do what I do and I want to do and I don't. Blah, 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 and it just seems like this big tug of war. First of all, if we're going to understand Romans 7, you have to sandwich it between Romans 6 and 8. Okay, Absolutely. and Romans 6, it's very explicit. We are set free from the power of sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. Okay, then you go into Romans 7. If we read it right. 
read the beginning of the chapter, it's talking about a man being married and when he's not in that marriage and, and, and the woman the man or the woman is now released from that marriage. They're no longer bound to that marriage. Then, uh, then he goes into this whole dispelling of back and forth, but he's free. And so Paul takes a rabbit trail, if you will, in that moment to kind of talk about his life outside of the spirit when he was still bound to this covenant of the law in that marriage. It's why he uses that imagery in the beginning of the chapter. Second to note, the, the spirit is not mentioned once in Romans 7, but mentioned a litany of times by the time you get right into Romans 8. Yes. So he can't be spot talking about life and spirit when he's talking about this thing. And first of all, it wouldn't jive either with a biblical perspective of regeneration. Big fancy word for us being made right by God. And because here's, here's the thing with theology. Don't ever base your theology on a pyramid. Can you guys see that? It topples over easily. So Romans 7 is that pyramid, but then you have all these scriptures that create a better foundation for you to really base your theology on that doesn't topple easily. Then if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, you see Paul say this, for I die daily. And people think that's me mutilating my flesh and putting it to death or whatever. And he's really talking about he's literally dying daily, suffering persecution. And so when you sandwich Romans 6 between Romans 8, he's, he's talking about his life under the, under the, under the law not under the law of the spirit and the spirit's not mentioned once in Romans seven, but mentioned a litany of times right when you get to Romans eight. And so, cause I know you might be there. And so my, 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 my thing to you is this, the proofs in the pudding. I have literally seen people be transformed by the power of God. My life first by believing the gospel nowhere in the Bible after the salvific experience, does it ever identify you as a sinner? Only a saint. That's right. You can't be a sinner saved by grace. It's an oxymoron. You're either saved by grace or you're a sinner. It's one or the other. Now, oh, what well, doesn't the Bible say if, if someone says he's not a sinner, he's a liar? I have, I was a sinner before God set me free. I am not, um, uh, you know, unaware of that fact. But I am aware of that I have freedom in Christ Jesus now. And Amen. so I don't. I think that we got to get away from trying to create these standards of holiness and allow holiness to come from the inside of us. And you find that um, there's real freedom there that um, I wasn't struggling with generational curses. The generational curse was undone in Adam. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good, man. I, I love, I love breaking down Romans six, seven and eight. You got to read it together. We put chapter divisions in there just to help people understand, you know, okay. You know, a, a good reference point or whatever, but it's one entire book. So you need to read this, you know, these, these, these important parts of scripture, you need to read them together. I love breaking down first Corinthians 15 because man, we just hear a preacher, you know, quote a verse and we just eat it and we say, okay, yeah, well that just, that's just what it is. And there's all these doctrines that are formed based on a theology that is being preached because these, you know, these group of preachers, you know, are using this verse in this way. But if we go back to the text and we we don't just look at one verse, but we look at what he's saying before, what he's saying after, we begin to see that we've been fed a whole bunch of lies that are keeping us trapped in bondage. But right. We need to abide in the word and to see the word for what it is. And then when we abide in that truth, the truth sets us free. And I, dude, I love it. I, th I thank God that you, that you're bringing light to these scriptures. We need more people just preaching the gospel. It is the power of God. And man, I wish we had a whole bunch more time to dissect all of these things, you know, because, you know, this is a controversial subjects for a lot of people. You're taking right. away their sin nature. You're taking away the bondage that they've been friends with, you know, that they've, that they've lived with for, you know, a majority of their lives that they've wanted to be free from. When you say it's just as easy as believing that it's not yours anymore, then people get a little bit offended and they want to throw out all these different scriptures. So, man, we're diving into deep subjects and we're breaking through ground, you know, faulty foundation, but we're still breaking through a foundation that was laid, you know, that has kept the church in so much bondage. We see it even today in the church. How come the church isn't shining? How come we're not manifesting the glory of God like the Bible says? How come there's not healings, miracles, signs, and wonders? How come so many Christians are still struggling with the same sin issues from when they first got saved? Well, we need to preach Christ and him crucified. We need to go back to the roots. And so anyway, man, that's why that, that's, that's what I love about you, your teaching, your ministry. And bro, before we get off this program today, I want you to pray for those who are watching 
And then um, whatever whatever's on your heart, man, to pray. Because there's people that are watching that are definitely struggling. There's people that are watching that heard some things you said, and you're like, you, you've, you've rattled their cage. So just pray for them, man. Whatever's on your heart, and um, I'm just going to give it to you. Yeah, I just want to just finish. I'll say this, and then we'll, we'll pray. Um, what I am saying is you're saying, well, if I don't have a sin nature, why do I sin? Mm-hmm. Why do I still have temptations? Well, here's the thing. Because it bothers you, because you know it's intimidation, because you have a conviction, I know it's not you. Yeah. Because I don't have to tell a dog to chase his tail. He just chases his tail. He's a dog. Because you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, that sin actually does bother you. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. We got to try to not complicate the gospel. And I'm and I'm being gracious just because it, it takes time to really believe this. And here's the gospel. It, John 8, 36. He who the son sets free is free indeed. Any other gospel that attaches a bondage on top of that is not a simplistic gospel. And you've got to do some theological um, gymnastics to make it work. And if it hurts my brain to understand it in that way that I'm still sinful, that just yeah. doesn't seem like the God that I serve, that he's gracious and a savior. Yeah. I just want to pray for you and, 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 and that you um, experience freedom. So yeah. definitely, I just come before you, God, and I pray over each and every person that is watching live and will uh, watch later in the day or maybe through someone sharing or, or, or just uh, giving this to someone. God, I pray right now that there would be freedom in Jesus' name. God, I pray for those who have been struggling with condemnation because of some mistakes. And I declare Romans 8-1 over you. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or those who have struggled with habitual sin issues, you're forgiven your love, you're accepted, and you're ultimately set free. God, I pray for those who are ministers and are walking people through the discipleship journey, and, and that can be messy, and it's hard to continue to love and love people when they continuously fail. But God, I pray that they would continue to put hope in the gospel to change people and not our ability to help them change their behavior. So God, I thank you for each and every person. I pray right now, God, that your presence would rest upon them in a fresh way. God, I pray that they would go out and their greatest testimony would ever be that they are known by you and you are known by them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, and even right now, I just prophesy the word of God to you, the word of God. Your lust was crucified with Christ on that cross. Your greed, your identity issues, your doubt, your religion, your unbelief, your uh, you know your grandfather's sin, the you know generational curses, you know whatever demonic bondage or stronghold was stripped on the cross, it died with Jesus Christ, and you co-rose with Him in resurrection, victory, and power, and you you didn't only rise with Him, you are now co-seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father above principality, power, might, dominion, every name that's a name, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. That's the scriptures. We have a victorious gospel, and it's not only his victory, but it's our victory through faith. Just like it says, you know, in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trial, you will have tribulation, but take heart for I have overcome the world. That's great. Praise God. Jesus overcame the world, but that's not good news for us until you believe first John. I believe it's chapter four where he says, this is how we we overcome the world, our faith. Amen. So Jesus overcame the world. And, and now when we believe that that um, in Christ we're more than overcomers, that we have the same spirit in us that rose Jesus from the dead, and we have the word of God inside of us in such a way where we believe this truth, this reality, then we step into the same victory that Jesus Christ purchased and bought for us. So be free in Jesus' name. You know why? Because you're free. That's right. You're free right now. You're free. And you say, oh, man, I feel like I'm in bondage. I've been trapped in this sin. Stop believing that you're trapped in sin and begin to believe that you're free from sin. Even before you manifest that reality, before you manifest the reality and before you have the feelings, you have to believe the word of God more than your experiences and more than your feelings. Being rooted in the truth, being rooted in the word of God will bring that victory and manifestation of it in your life. And that's exactly what Gabriel was sharing in this broadcast. We've both, I was a drug addict. He, you know, he had his own struggles with anger and with identity issues and insecurity. I had my struggles with performance and striving and drugs and lust. And the Lord literally, these chains began to break 
off of our lives. And they were really imaginary chains and our own, uh, the, the, the figment, of our, figment of our own imagination because Jesus already broke those chains. But these lies that, that, that were on us began to fall off and we began to walk in holiness and freedom as we caught a revelation of this beautiful gospel. So, bro, I'm so glad that you came on today and were able to pour out this truth to those who are watching. And man, if people that, if you want to be connected with his ministry, he's a, he's a youth pastor right now in Fort Myers at First Assembly of God Church in Fort Myers. So he's a youth pastor, but you also travel itinerant, you know, I, you know, you do itinerant ministry as you're able to leave and you do that a lot. So you can go to ZamoraMinistries.org or you can follow him on social media. How could people get a hold of you, man, and tell them maybe, um, are, are you traveling a lot itinerantly now or? I will. I pick up more in the spring and summer, and we've been really concentrating on the local church right now, especially with transition and our kids. But yeah, I I, I do travel itinerantly, so you can find me at zamoraministries.org, or I mean, from this Facebook page, you can we can become friends and message me through there. If you're on Instagram, Gabriel R. I include the middle initial Gabriel R. Zamora as another way we can get in contact, and I'm available. I would love to hear your questions and kind of. Talk to you guys, and um, yeah, the world needs you, so I'm committed to you. Amen. Amen. I love you, bro. I'm always going to love you, and I can't wait to see you sometime soon. Yes, sir. Thanks for taking time to be with me, man. I love you. Love you, too. All right, we'll talk soon. I'm going to stay right. on here and just do some announcements, but we'll talk to you soon, man. All right. All right, everybody. This was Awaken Live. You can go ahead and share this at the bottom. Thank you guys for tuning in. You can go to my website life poured out intl.org i'll just put that here at the bottom you can find out more about our ministry my wife and i we are full-time evangelists we're, we're in full-time itinerant ministry but we're also here in new jersey pioneering a work in perth amboy hosting god's presence through conferences and worship nights and doing weekly outreaches empowering the church but we also do overseas ministry i go to the i'm going to the philippines this year i'm going to the dominican republic to do six days of crusades and we also travel all around the u.s pouring into the church we believe in the church our heart is to ignite the church so there's a booking section on the website if you want to call me up it's my joy to meet new people new churches to uh, partner with you to see a move of the Holy Spirit. My passion is to preach the word of God with authority and power and to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit because one touch from the presence of God, one moment in his presence, one prophecy, one word of knowledge, one encounter in worship absolutely changes everything. So anyway, we're doing immerse conferences all over. Um, it's a one day of just encounter with Jesus. We create a space for the Holy Spirit to fill. No agenda except to know him. Our first one is in New Jersey. It was absolutely transformative. So we're doing our next one, March 3rd in Dallas, Texas. I'm going to put the link to our website, the link to Eventbrite, where you can go and sign up if you're in Texas or in the Dallas area. We have Upper Room that, that is going to be leading worship with us. You can find them on YouTube. Um, God's really exalting them now in this season because of their pure hearts, their devotion, who they are, the worship they're creating. So I just, I love you guys. We value you. You can become a partner with this ministry. Help us move forward. We're really believing God for more partners, monthly partners, or one-time, you know, givers just to help bring this ministry to another level so we can travel to more places, preach the gospel in more places to see fruit. This gospel bears fruit. This gospel overcomes every adversity. And we're seeing it. We're seeing people saved, healed, delivered, equipped. Impartation is being released, not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ, because of his finished work. And we're just his children. They get to yield and walk with him and partner with him to see him touch lives, to see him transform lives. So we bless you guys. I'm going to put a link in the status and comment section for me and Gabriel Zamora. And I'm excited to announce to you that my next guest on Awaken Live is going to be Jamie Galloway from Global Awakening. Uh, it's an honor to connect with him and have him on here, as well as Havala Cunnington. She wrote a book, Stronger Than the Struggle. She's from Bethel. She's going to be on as well on at, um, February 8th. And I'm really excited to have William Paul Young, the author of The Shack. He's going to be on with me February 13th. And in these coming days, we're going to have more incredible authors, ministers, evangelists on to encourage you and to build you up. And remember this, that in the archives, I have archives on my website. There's an Awaken Live page on my website where you can watch the archives to be built up. You know, if you've got time or if you're driving in your car, you can just listen to them. Or you can go to our YouTube channel and you can subscribe. I just opened up a YouTube channel, so it's not as pretty as 
It will be one day. We don't have a whole lot of followers on there now, but you can go and you can subscribe to the channel. You'll get an alert every time there's a new Awaken Live video on there. And also, we're constantly posting now videos. We're really pushing videos, two-minute, three-minute prophetic encouragements. We're posting them on our Facebook page, and we're also posting them on YouTube. So you can follow me on Facebook, my um, personal page. I have 5,000 friends, so you can't friend request me, but you can follow me on that page. Or I have a public figure page that I'm really pushing towards now that you can follow me and you can like that page. So anyway, if you want to find out more information about Life Poured Out International, our mission is to reach the lost ignite the church and serve the poor. And we're doing just that. You can find our events and everything we're doing on our website, on our Facebook. We're constantly posting. We have my book as well as other resources on there as well for you to grab hold of, for you to learn, for you to learn the truth and for the truth to set you free. So love you guys. God bless you. I'll see you next time on Awaken Live.